Tonight's presentation is titled Breaking Good, and our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated and uh, author for numerous aviation publications, holds a certified flight instructor certificate, a A&P mechanic certificate with inspection authorization privileges. Uh, in 2008, he was the Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year with the FAA, a member of EAA. Mike, thank you so much for volunteering your time and continuing your information being brought to us on a monthly basis through the webinar series. We sure are happy and uh, very uh, grateful to you for, for making this time available to us and sharing your information. I'm going to turn control of the presentation over to you. Well, thanks, Tim, and uh, good evening, everybody. It looks like uh, we have uh, 650 or something people in the room already, which is wonderful. I, by the way, uh, I, I, you mentioned that uh, Aircraft Spruce uh, uh, s supports these web this webinar series. I, I've been personally supporting Aircraft Spruce for about the last month. I've been working on the annual on my airplane, and I don't think I've gone two days without putting it in order to Aircraft Spruce, but I'm pleased to say that the airplane is all put back together, and tomorrow morning I do the post-annual test flight. So everybody wish me luck that that will be a nice successful flight and everything will work. It will be very nice to have my airplane back again. Uh, as um, Tim mentioned, uh, tonight's uh, webinar is called Breaking Good. It's a little bit of pun, but uh, the subject is um, cylinder break-in. Um, we're going to be talking about how to break in new cylinders. This is a uh, an area that I get a lot of questions about from aircraft owners, um, and uh, it's the kind of thing that we need to do from time to time under various situations. It may be that we have just replaced one or two cylinders in the course of, of, uh, uh, of maintenance. Uh, maybe they came in with low compression or a bad exhaust valve or something. Um, sometimes we break in all of the cylinders at once uh, doing a top overhaul. Sometimes we break them in when a new or rebuilt or freshly overhauled engine is installed on the airplane. So there are all these situations that, uh, that involve uh, doing break-in. You know, one of the questions I get quite a bit is, gee, I only replaced one cylinder. Do I really have to go in the break-in procedure? Uh, and, of course, the answer is yes. The new cylinder doesn't know about the other ones, uh, and it, it, it needs to be uh, broken in properly, and we'll be talking about exactly why that is. Uh, but there's a tremendous amount of stuff written on this subject. If you Google um, aircraft cylinder break-in, uh, you'll be absolutely amazed at how many hits you get uh, because everybody seems to have something to say on this subject. Um, the engine manufacturers uh, have break-in instructions, typically in the form of service bulletins. Uh, the Continental Service Bulletin is M89-7, Revision 1. Lycoming has service instruction 1427B. Um, some of the uh, PMA cylinder manufacturers uh, have their own service bulletins on, on how to break in their cylinders, superior air parts, uh, ECI, who um, is n no longer in business. They were, they, they, they were uh, acquired by Continental, but uh, there are a lot of ECI cylinders out there. Um, various engine overhaul shops, uh, Ram, Penyan, Victor Aviation, uh, to name a few, have their own uh, uh, write-ups on on how they want engines broken in. Even the Shell Oil companies weighed in on this subject. It seems a little surprising, but uh, Shell Oil has a uh, uh, has a service memorandum uh, about break-in where they're talking about uh, uh, choice of oil and so on to use for break-in. Um, and, and if you read all this stuff, it can get pretty confusing. There, there are some common threads that everybody kind of agrees on, but there's lots of disagreement on, about exactly what power settings, what type of oil to use, uh, when to change it, how long the break-in should take, that sort of thing. Um, so I wanted to, to try to address that subject um, and do so by uh, going back to basics and discussing why we have to do this in the first place, what we're trying to achieve, 
and, and what the basic conditions are that we have to create in order to uh, break in cylinders properly. So let's let's uh, let's go back and take a look at at what a cylinder looks like. Um, uh, here's uh, a couple of pictures of uh, th these happen to be Lycoming cylinders, um, but Continental cylinders are very similar. And um, the, the cylinders uh, uh, are composed of, the cylinder assemblies really have three major sub-assemblies. There's an aluminum alloy cylinder head um, that is uh, attached uh, via a uh, an interference fit joint to a hardened steel barrel. Um, and inside that hardened steel barrel is an aluminum, aluminum alloy piston that reciprocates up and down inside the barrel. Um, that piston um, has at least three piston rings, sometimes four. Uh, the top two rings are called compression rings and their purpose is to seal the uh, to provide a gas tight seal or a relatively gas tight seal um, as the piston rides up and down inside the cylinder to uh, to provide the uh, uh, integrity of the combustion chamber and to prevent um, combustion gases from uh, uh, fr from getting down past the piston into the crankcase. Uh, the third ring, which if you look carefully, is a slotted ring, um, is called the oil control ring. Uh, its job is not to seal. Its job is to smear oil on the cylinder wall as the piston goes up and down. Uh, it's fed by a bunch of holes that are drilled in the piston, in the uh, in the groove in which that oil control ring is is mounted, and the oil gets splashed onto the bottom of the piston, comes out of these little holes, goes in between the this in, in, into the slot of the slotted oil control ring and the oil control ring smears the oil on the cylinder walls as the piston goes up and down in a controlled way. Uh, some of our pistons have a fourth ring that's mounted down below the piston pin called a scraper ring, um, but uh, uh, not all of the pistons are four ring pistons. This particular one uh, from a small bore like combing is a three ring piston with just the two compression rings and oil control ring. Um, so as the piston reciprocates inside the barrel, uh, the oil control ring keeps an oil film smeared on the cylinder wall. And because there's an oil film on the cylinder wall, the compression rings actually hydroplane on that oil film uh, to provide what's called hydrodynamic lubrication. Um, and the purpose of that is to prevent the rings from actually being in physical contact with the cylinder wall and, and causing friction and wear. Instead, the rings actually hydroplane on this thin film of oil uh, that we have to maintain on the cylinder wall. Now, when a cylinder like this is manufactured, uh, the, the, the cylinder barrel uh, comes comes from the forging house as a raw, raw forging. It goes into a CNC uh, 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 numerically controlled uh, machine tool, which machines the fins and the barrel. And the barrel is finished to a, uh, to, to a, a, a very tight tolerances. And when it comes out of the CNC machine, the cylinder barrel initially is mirror smooth. Um, now that might seem like it'd be a good thing, but it turns out it's not a good thing because if you have a mirror smooth steel surface, it's impossible to get an oil film uh, to coat a mirror smooth steel surface. If you try to do that, what happens is that the oil beads up into discrete droplets instead of um, in, in, instead of uh, uh, being a film um, on the uh, uh, an even film on the surface. Um, it's the same kind of thing that you see if you if you spray water on a freshly waxed car. The 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 the, the, the water doesn't wet the surface; it beads up on the wax. And engineers say that a 
mirror smooth surface is not oil wettable. That's the, the, the term of art, meaning that the, the oil won't, um, won't maintain a film on a mirror smooth surface. So in order to make the barrel oil wettable, which is essential to uh, uh, provide this hydrodynamic lubrication and to minimize friction and wear, the surface of, that, of the cylinder that comes out of the CNC machine mirror smooth has to be roughened. It has to be roughened just a little bit. And this is accomplished using a honing tool uh, that uses a very hard, uh, typically 220 grit stones um, to, uh, that spun inside the barrel and run up, up and down inside the barrel while it's spun to create a crosshatch pattern of tiny little scratches that you should be able to see uh, in this photograph. That's what a newly honed cylinder barrel looks like when you get a new cylinder from the factory. That crosshatch pattern um, is sometimes called a micro finish because the scratches are very, very shallow scratches. Uh, typically, uh, the, the, the crosshatch pattern is honed to about 30 micro inches, 30 millionths of an inch deep. So it's, uh, they're, they're, they're quite subtle. Um, you can, you really can't even feel them running a fingernail over them, uh, but you can see them. And, um, those scratches are there to provide, uh, to make the surface oil wettable uh, by providing kind of a foothold for the oil um, to, to hang on to the surface. Now, if you were to look at a cross section of a cylinder barrel after you apply this, this cross hatch, uh, what you'd see, this, this is kind of crude diagram, but you'd see a series of peaks and valleys that, that are carved by by the home. Um, and the valleys, uh, or fissures, if you want to call them that, are, are what we want because they're what cause the surface to be auto, um, oil wettable by providing uh, something for the oil to grab onto on the surface so it won't beat up. Um, so it provides, it, it's kind of the same way that, that you, you, you might sand a, a surface before applying paint to it or before applying uh, glue to it uh, so that it that, that it hangs on better. Uh, the, the, this is kind of the same principle. The, the surface needs to be just slightly roughened and the, the honing that crosshatch pattern is what provides that very tiny uh, amount of roughness. Um, so the valleys are what we want. The peaks, on the other hand, are a problem. The, the peaks um, uh, increase friction and cause the barrels to run hot. They, they, they encourage metal-to-metal -metal contact. Uh, the peaks tend to want to breach through the oil film. Um, and so th the purpose of uh, break-in is to try to get rid of the peaks, to smooth off those peaks while leaving the valleys intact. Um, and that's really what we're trying to achieve uh, when we break in the cylinder. We've got this fresh hone pattern um, that has created peaks and valleys. We want to keep the valleys, but we want to uh, smooth off the peaks. Um, now, it would be kind of nice if this was done at the factory instead of us having to do it. And to some extent, it, it is. Um, some uh, cylinder manufacturers use what's called a multi-step honing process where uh, after they, uh, they, they hone the crosshatch pattern in, they use a finer hone to try to, to, to round off some of the peaks. Um, all um, factory new engines, factory rebuilt engines, and some overhauled engines, depending on what shop they're overhauled at, are, uh, get a run-in in in a test cell. Um, uh, Typically, they're, they're run in for 30 minutes, maybe up, up, um, as much uh, as an hour in a test cell with a, with a club prop on it. And the run in starts this break in process. Um, but nobody wants to run the engines in a test cell for too long because it's really hard to provide adequate cooling in a test cell. Uh, you really want to be 
moving at 150 knots or so uh, in order to get enough airflow over the engine. So typically the run-ins are relatively short, uh, just long enough to make sure that everything works properly. Um, and when we replace cylinders in the field, of course, um, there is no run-in. The, the engine doesn't get in the test cell because it's still sitting on the airplane. Um, so field replace cylinders, the, the ones that were, where we will replace, you know, one or two cylinders during an annual or maybe even doing a top overhaul. Those are the ones that really need the, the break in the worst because they, they don't get any sort of a pre break in, um, in, in a, in a test cell. Um, but in all cases, the final break-in is always left to the pilot who flies the, the first uh, couple of uh, post-install uh, flights. So it's really up to us to, um, to do the break-in or at least finish the break-in. So let's talk about the basics of how we do that. Um, during normal engine operation, as we talked about, the, the goal is that we want to lubricate the cylinder barrel with an oil film that's sufficiently strong and sufficiently thick to prevent most metal-to-metal -metal contact between the compression rings and the cylinder barrel wall. And that, that's, that's really what the whole purpose of the lubrication is. Um, and our objective is to eliminate metal-to-metal -metal contact uh, through lubrication. Uh, that's not done, that, that isn't completely successful because if you think about it, um, at top dead center and bottom dead center, when the piston comes to a halt and reverses direction, um, during that very brief period, uh, what's called the ring reversal period, where the piston stops going up and starts going down or vice versa, um, you don't have the hydroplaning effect anymore because the, the, the rings aren't moving relative to the piston, uh, or I mean re relative to the, uh, the cylinder barrel. So we do tend to get some metal metal contact right up at top dead center and right down at bottom dead center, particularly at top dead center um, because of all the pressure that, that exists up there. And so when, when you look at a partially worn cylinder, the one that's been in service for a while, you always see a, a wear step up at the very, very top of the stroke. But at least for the rest of the, bear, the, rest of the stroke, um, the, the objective is for the oil film to prevent any kind of metal-to-metal -metal contact, and it does that pretty effectively. Um, that's during normal operation, but during break-in, the, the goal is just the opposite. We want metal-to-metal -metal contact. We want to breach the oil film during the break-in period uh, in, in order to um, cause enough metal-to-metal -metal contact between the compression rings and the cylinder barrel to grind off or round off, if you will, the sharp peaks of the crosshatch while leaving the valleys intact. So we, we have a somewhat different objective during break-in than we do during normal operation. And in order to, to breach the oil film and to create the necessary metal-to-metal -metal contact between the compression ring and the cylinder wall, uh, we need to run the engine really, really hard for the first hour or two because it is the gas pressure in the combustion chamber that is what forces the rings against the cylinder wall. The, 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 the rings have what's called a semi-trapezoidal cross-section, and um, that's designed so that gas pressure from the combustion chamber is what forces the, the compression ring against the cylinder wall, particularly the number one compression ring, um, which is the, the one that gets the most uh, pressure from this and does the lion's share of the work when it comes to doing the break-in. So we need to maximize combustion gas pressures, and we, we do that by running the engine really hard during break-in. Um, at the same time, that we're maximizing this pressure by running the engine hard, it's also important that the oil film is not too strong to be breached. So we have to be careful about what oil we choose. Um, traditionally, um, break-in has been done using something called straight mineral oil, which is uh, an all petroleum oil uh, like Aeroshell 100, 
that has no synthetics, no ashless dispersants, no anti-wear or anti-scuff additives, no viscosity index improvers, nothing that would um, improve the, the, uh, uh, the film strength or minimize friction because we're looking for friction. So normally we're using a really, really simple basic oil with a minimum of additives uh, for the break-in process because we actually want the oil film to be breached during break-in. Um, so using straight mineral oil is what's been traditionally used over the years. But in recent years, some of the manufacturers and overhaul shops have been moving away from that recommendation um, and recommending using um, some more sophisticated oils. And I'm, I, I'm of that mind, and I generally don't like to use straight mineral oil. It's, it's not terrible, but it's not, not my favorite thing to use for break-in. What we want to avoid at all costs during break-in is we want to avoid any oil that has synthetics in it. Because synthetic oils, semi-synthetic oils, have higher film strength than petroleum-based oils. And that's a good thing for normal operation, and it's a bad thing for break-in. We also want to avoid the use of any anti-wear or any scuff additives um, that are also, that they're friction modifiers, and that they, they, they chemically minimize the, uh, the, the wear that occurs um, when the, the, the rings pass over the barrel. And we don't want that to happen during break-in. That's exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do. So we want to avoid synthetics. We want to avoid any anti-wear or anti-scuff additives. On the other hand, um, I haven't seen no persuasive evidence that using oil with, an, with ashless dispersants in them, which is what we normally use in our operating wells, uh, is any less effective for break-in than using straight mineral oil that doesn't have ashless dispersants. And the purpose of ashless dispersants is to keep the engines cleaner and to minimize the buildup of sludge. And since uh, I've not seen any evidence that AD oil is any less effective for break-in, um, and because it does keep engines cleaner, I prefer to break in using AD oil rather than straight mineral oil. So th this picture shows um, a bottle of Aeroshell W100. W100 is the AD oil. Aeroshell 100 without the W is their straight mineral oil that, that doesn't have the ashless dispersants. And my preference would be to use the AD oil rather than the straight mineral oil. Now there's some controversy over whether it's better to use a single weight oil or a multi-grade oil for break-in. Traditionally, again, the, the oils that have been used for break-in are single weight oil. Uh, uh, most of the break-ins I've done during my 50 years as an aircraft owner have been done with Aeroshell W100 and quite effectively, but um, there is a, at least a moderately persuasive argument that using an all petroleum multigrade oil without any synthetics and without any anti-scuff additives, an oil like Philips uh, 20W50 um, is, is, a, uh, is a marginally better choice for break-in uh, than a single weight oil. And the last time I broke in cylinders, which was in 2015 on my airplane, I used uh, the Philips uh, 20W50 uh, uh, as a break-in oil. And uh, uh, so uh, I, I, I think that, that that's a good choice for break-in oil. Airish W100 has served me well for break-in oil. What you want to avoid is any of this stuff. Uh, the, starting going from left to right, Aeroshell 15W50, that's a semi-synthetic oil, 50% synthetic oil with a whole bunch of anti-scuff additives thrown in to boot. Definitely don't want an oil like that. 
The next one is Exxon Elite. That's also a semi-synthetic. It's only 25% synthetic, uh, but has a whole bunch of anti-scuff additives. Don't want to use that. The next one over there is Aerochel W100 Plus. That's the same as W100, but they add anti-scuff additives to it. And uh, so I would prefer not to use that oil. The fourth one over is CamGuard, which is a which is a, a an aftermarket additive uh, that I use in my airplane, but I never use it during break-in um, because again, it's it's full of friction modifiers. It's the try to reduce friction and wear. Not a good idea when you're doing the break-in. Really good idea after the break-in's complete. And the last thing on the on the right hand side is a bottle of uh, of Lycoming uh, engine oil additive L LW. What is it, 16702 or something like that, if that's the right number? Um, that That's uh, Lycoming's um, uh, uh, anti-scuff additive. It's, uh, it's triphenyl phosphate um, that they recommend. And actually, it's required in, in certain Lycoming engines um, and recommended in other Lycoming engines, uh, but not a good idea during break-in. So um, these are all the things that we want to avoid when it comes to oil. Okay, so we said that we need to run the engine hard during break-in um, in order to provide enough pressure against the uh, number one compression ring so that it will breach the oil film and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, abrade off the, the peaks of the, uh, of, of the crosshatch pattern. But how hard do we want to run the engine? Well, this is one of these areas where if you read all of the stuff that's been written by the various engine manufacturers, cylinder manufacturers, overhaul shops, nobody agrees on how hard to run it. Um, there's all kinds of different recommendations as to how hard to run it, how long to run it, whether to change power from one thing to another on a cyclical basis, all kinds of different recommendations, and nobody seems to agree. Um, I take a very... Um, simple-minded approach to this. Um, my theory is when we're breaking in a cylinder, we want to run the engine as hard as we possibly can, as close to 100% power as we possibly can for the first hour or two. But we need to be careful not to overheat and damage the new cylinders. So we want to run the engine as hard as we can without overheating the cylinders. And um, the, the best way to do that is by reference to an engine monitor that's instrumenting the cylinder head temperature of each cylinder. Um, new cylinders will naturally run hotter than they normally would until the break-in process is complete. In fact, that's the best way to, to determine when break-in is complete because the cylinder head temperatures will come down noticeably the reason that they run hotter is because those peaks are, are causing excess friction, uh, and that is reflected in terms of, of, of uh, uh, heat that's measured with the cylinder head temperature uh, probe. And once we've once we've removed those peaks and and, and lowered the amount of friction, then we, we we will see cylinder head temperatures come down. But the best way to run the engine hard, but not too hard, in my view, is to use a, an engine monitor uh, that displays the cylinder head temperature of every cylinder. And more than 50% of our piston fleet now are equipped with, uh, with a probe per cylinder engine monitor equipment of some kind or another. And, um, you know, if I were king for a day, I would say all, all of our piston engines should be equipped with an engine monitor because that's, that's really the only way you can tell what's going on. Um, so I've, I've talked about engine monitors a lot in the past, but here's one case where they, where, where they're particularly useful. And that's when you're breaking in cylinder. So what I recommend, uh, assuming that you do have an engine monitor and can see what the cylinder head temperatures of each cylinder is, um, is to run as close to maximum power as you possibly can without allowing any CHT to exceed 420 degrees Fahrenheit for continental cylinders or 440 degrees Fahrenheit for Lycoming cylinders. 
Lycoming cylinders tend to run about 20 degrees hotter than continental cylinders for a bunch of good reasons. And they are built to tolerate higher cylinder head temperatures than, than continental cylinders. Um, so those are the, the guidelines that I would offer. Now, now, 420 is too hot, in my view, for normal um, operation. I, I normally recommend not exceeding 400 degrees for continental cylinders or 420 for Lycomings, and I actually like to see them a little lower than that. But for break-in, we know that the cylinders are going to be running hotter than usual, and we should expect that and allow for that. But we do need to set some sort of a limit that we, we won't exceed, and these are the, the limits that, uh, that I recommend using uh, for, for break-in purposes. Those are, are hot but not abusively hot values, in my view. 420 for Continentals, 440 for Lycoming Cylinders. Run the engine like this for an hour or two uh, until you see the CHTs come down noticeably, indicating that um, braking is largely complete and you've, uh, you, you've got most of the job done. That's really what we're looking to do. It's really important to run the engine hard right from the outset when, uh, especially after a new engine is installed in an airplane, a newer overhauled engine is installed in an airplane, there's a temptation to go out and do a bunch of ground runs to make sure that, you know, nothing's leaking and so on. Um, that's really bad for the cylinders. We want to absolutely minimize ground operations when we're breaking in new cylinders. We want to um, go to high power as quickly as we can and stay there for an hour or two. Um, and here's why. Um, if we run a freshly honed cylinder at low power, uh, which is what we would do if we were idling it or taxing it for a long time or doing an extended run-up even, um, we risk um, glazing the cylinders. The, the glazing is a situation where um, a, a residue of carbonized oil builds up in the, in the, in the hone pattern um, and winds up stopping the break-in period dead in its tracks. Once a cylinder gets glazed, uh, you can't break it in no matter how hard you run it. And uh, typically the only thing you can do is pull the cylinders off, rehone them and start all over again, which we definitely don't wanna do if we can possibly avoid it. So the best defense against glazing a cylinder is to minimize the amount of low power operation uh, until the cylinder is broken in. Here's, here's a, a diagram that I think kind of illustrates this fairly well. On the left, we have a freshly honed cylinder with all these peaks and valleys and a compression ring that's running up and down that we would like to smooth off the peaks. The center picture shows what we're, what we're trying to achieve, a properly broken in cylinder where those sharp peaks have been, have, have been honed down by the compression ring. Uh, and so we still have the valleys that we need in order for the cylinder wall to be oil wettable but we've gotten rid of the peaks uh, that cause um, excessive heat, friction, wear. The right-hand photo shows a, a glazed cylinder um, where this a tough film of carbonized oil has filled in the hone pattern um, in, in a way that makes the, the break-in um, impossible. And the glazing uh, occurs when there's protracted low power operation of the cylinder prior to the time it's broken in. Um, so that's what we're trying to avoid. So just to, to review the basic rules for break-in is pretty simple. Three rules, use the right oil. Don't use anything with synthetics or any scuffs. Uh, you can use single weight or multi-grade. You can use straight mineral oil. You can use AD oil. As long as you don't have any synthetics or any scuffs in it, um, it's going to work pretty well for break-in. Run the engine hard, as close to 100% power as possible without uh, uh, achieving abusive CHTs. 
and minimize ground and low power operations, at least for the first couple of hours to avoid uh, the risk of glazing the cylinder and stopping the, the, the break-in from, from happening properly. How long should this take? Um, you know, as I said, if you do it right, the lion's share of the break-in is going to happen the first hour or two. You, you, you should actually be able to see it happen because you'll see the cylinder head temperatures come down. And, you know, frequently, if you're breaking in a new engine, uh, you, you'll see different cylinders come down uh, at different times. They don't want to all come down exactly at the same time, but you should see a noticeable decrease in cylinder head temperature, and that's a pretty good clue that you, you've succeeded in breaking the cylinder. Um, th that, that's five hours, shouldn't take more than five hours to break in a, a, a normal steel cylinder if, if, if you do things the, the, the way I've, I've outlined here. Um, nickel carbide cylinders um, uh, tend to break in very, very rapidly. Um, uh, that's one of the beauty of them. Um, I, when I changed all the cylinders on my airplane um, in 2015, uh, I, I had all steel cylinders. I put all nickel cylinders on. They broke in like instantly, and, and the, the oil consumption is extremely low. Uh, I, I really like nickel carb carbide cylinders myself, I, 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 and, and that's what I've chosen for, for my airplane going forward. Um, at, at the, other, the other end of the spectrum, channel chrome cylinders, um, are, are, which are, are cylinders that are are, are plated with with chrome and, and then the, they aren't honed because chrome is too hard to hone effectively but they achieve oil wettability in a different way by something called a channeling process where at the very end of the plating process they reverse the direction of the current and, and start the electroplating operation going in reverse uh, in a way that causes a um, a, a spider-like network of, of little cracks to develop in the surface that provide the necessary surface roughness. Uh, channel chrome cylinders, they're very hard. They wear very, very well, but they uh, are very hard to break in. They take a lot longer. They can take up to 50 hours to break in. And even after you've broken them in as, as well as it's possible to do, uh, they tend to have higher oil consumption than steel or, or nickel carbide cylinders. That's not necessarily a bad thing. As I said, they're excellent cylinders. They have very good longevity. Uh, they don't, they're, they're immune from corrosion. There are a lot of good things to be said for channel chrome cylinders, but they do take a while to break in and they, uh, they, they always will, uh, will burn more oil or consume more oil um, than a standard steel cylinder will. And especially a nickel carbide cylinder. They're, they're all good cylinders. They all have pros and cons, um, uh, but those are the basic characteristics. And um, uh, Tim, that kind of wraps up my prepared material, but I would be happy to, uh, to open it up for questions. Okay, Mike, great. We got a bunch of questions, so let's get right into it. Uh, Gwen was wondering, uh, how does one know when you have run the engine enough to get the break-in properly accomplished? Well, the, the, the two clues um, uh, to uh, knowing when break-in is, is accomplished, one, as I said, is that the uh, cylinder head temperatures will, will decrease from an abnormally high value to a normal value. And the second, the, the second symptom, if you will, of properly broken in cylinders is that oil consumption will stabilize at a reasonable value. Um, they always, the, 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 most of the memos that you read or service bulletins talk about determining that breaking is complete when oil consumption stabilizes, uh, but that's because all those things were written back in the days when, when, when uh, the, our aircraft engines had very primitive instrumentation and nobody could look at individual cylinder head temperatures. Now that the majority of our engines have some kind of engine monitor equipment where we can monitor individual CHTs, I think the most direct way of, of, uh, of knowing when break-in has occurred is simply to see that cylinder head temperatures 
return to a to a normal value from a, the abnormally high value that you expect when you have a freshly honed cylinder. So Mark's question is uh, for a small engine like a Continental A65 without an engine monitor, is oil temperature a way to indicate the progress for break-in? It's a pretty indirect way, and I'm not sure that that it's it's particularly useful. The problem with oil temperature is that it's thermostatically regulated. So you have a, a, a vernotherm valve, an oil thermostat, that's trying to maintain oil temperature at a constant value. So it kind of masks the the uh, the heat load on it. If oil temperature were allowed to free float the way cylinder head temperature is then it might might give you some useful information but because oil temperature is thermostatically controlled it really doesn't tell you very much mm. donald's wondering during the break-in period would you run lean of peak or full rich i tend to run full rich during the break-in period um, again because we're trying to achieve maximum uh, cylinder pressure and uh, when you operate lean of peak, you're reducing peak pressure in the combustion chamber, which again is normally a, a, a wonderful thing, <laughs> but for break-in, it's not such a wonderful thing. So I, I tend to run uh, uh, full rich cow flaps open, uh, you know, very shallow climbs, uh, uh, high air speeds, anything I can do to get as much cooling air over the cylinders as I can, because the more cooling air I can get over the cylinders, the, the higher power I can run them. And that's really what I'm trying trying to do. Harold's wondering, uh, how can you detect glazing if you suspect it? Uh, can it be confirmed by a bore scope or some other method? Yeah, that's the best way. Uh, is would be to uh, to put a bore scope in the cylinder, and uh, it, glazing is usually pretty obvious under the bore scope. And Frank is wondering, why is a glazed cylinder bad? Well, a glaze cylinder is bad because the, the glazing um, stops the break-in process uh, prematurely. It doesn't allow the, the um, it, it basically clogs up that hone pattern uh, so that the, um, the, 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 the rings can't um, effectively uh, round off the top of those peaks to get the kind of pattern that we're looking for and the glazed cylinder is not um that doesn't have the the oil wettability characteristics that we're looking for and typically in the glazed cylinder the oil consumption will not not stabilize at a reasonable value griff is wondering now uh, what should oil analysis look like during this process well you kind of expect to oil analysis to 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 have elevated wear metals particularly elevated iron and uh, most people don't even bother to send in a, a, a sample of the break-in oil. That, by the way, that's something else that I, I meant to have on a slide, but I didn't, I, I, I think I neglected to do. Um, but a, a lot of the stuff that, that you read recommends changing the break-in oil at 25 hours. I, I tend to like to get rid of it sooner than that. I normally get rid of it by 10 hours. If, if you know if you haven't if if you haven't broken in the cylinder completely in, in ten hours and there's something wrong, and uh, the break-in oil does have, you know, uh, a fair amount of metal floating around in it, and so it's a good idea to get rid of it. Um, I would tend, just in an abundance of caution, not to start using synthetics or uh, any scuff additives until the first normal oil change at, you know, 25 to 50 hours. Um, uh, I personally don't like to use synthetic oils uh, anytime, uh, as long as we're running engines on unleaded fuel. Um, I mean, unleaded leaded fuel. Once we start running on unleaded fuel, then we'll be able to run uh, synthetics. We'll probably want to always run synthetics, but synthetics and lead have a, have a problem. They don't get along very nicely together. Um, but you definitely want to avoid using synthetics or any scuffs for a, a while longer than that. But I tend to like to get rid of the break-in oil about 10 hours just because it's contaminated by the break-in process. And Jerry's just wondering, when should you start oil analysis after break-in? 
I, I would, uh, well, I, I recommend sending in a sample at every oil change, and the only exception to that would be I, I probably wouldn't bother to send in the, the break-in oil. Uh, but at once the break-in oil has been drained out and you put normal operating oil in there, I think I would start sending that to oil analysis every every subsequent oil change. Edward's wondering, any harm to any of the other cylinders when breaking in only one or two new cylinders? Well, you know, to be honest with you, it's it's not the greatest thing in the world for the other cylinders to 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 be run that aggressively, but um, you really don't have any choice. I mean, I I don't like to change cylinders in the field in general if I can avoid it, um, but sometimes you have to. And uh, uh, it the, the the way we operate the engine during break-in is, you know, kind of borderline abusive maybe. But if we do it right, we're only having to do that for an hour or two. So it's uh, the... the, the uh, the, the cylinders, the other cylinders are, are not being abused for any kind of prolonged period of time. It's just, you know, you, it's just a compromise you have to make. It's not perfect, but we don't have any way of, if we change one cylinder, we don't have any way of breaking in that one cylinder and, and leaving the other cylinders operating in the normal way. There's just no way to do that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. William's wondering, with home belts, how do you get away from uh, ground runs, getting all the gauges calibrated on a new aircraft, new engine, um, also new prop, uh, you know, needs a couple of cycles to make sure it is full oil in it. Any suggestions for that? Well, again, uh, um, you do what you have to do, but there's an awful lot of stuff that, doesn't absolutely have to be done before first flight and 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 could be the, the tweaking could be deferred an hour or two um so i i would not run the engine any longer than necessary it's it, everything's you know everything's a trade-off um but uh i i would only do the absolute essential ground running and keep it to a keep it to a minimum um realizing that you're running the risk of glazing the cylinders when you uh, when you run the engine um, at low power uh, with freshly honed cylinders. William's wondering, what is acceptable oil usage during break-in? Oh, I don't know that there's an answer to that, and I don't think anybody bothers to measure that. The, the real the, the, the real issue is what has oil consumption stabilized at once the cylinders are broken in. Rowan is wondering, where does all the metal from break-in go? Into the oil filter, or does one need to clean out the sump thoroughly during a change? No, I mean, the, 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 most of the, some of the stuff gets caught in the oil filter. Uh, the, the, the tinier stuff just keeps, just circulates around in the oil and doesn't hurt anything, but we want to get rid of it. Um, really big stuff would be caught in the suction screen, but hopefully break-in doesn't generate any really big stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ronald, uh, I'm sorry, Donald is wondering, uh, when can you return to lean of peak operations? As soon as break-in is complete. Um, and again, um, if, if, if all indications are that the break-in has been successful after the first couple of hours, I wouldn't hesitate to go to Lena Peak after that. James is wondering, typically, is the break-in done in one or two flights or over a period of several? It's best done in one or two flights. Uh, again, we, we the more flights you chop it into, the more ground running you're going to be doing. And so, optimally, it would be better to to to, to take off and fly it hard for a couple hours, um, or you know, failing that maybe two one hour flights. But I wouldn't chop it up into a bunch of fifteen minute flights because that means that you're doing a whole lot of, of low power operation, both taxiing out and descent and landing and taxiing back in. All those things are running the engine at low power, which is what we're trying to kind of avoid during the first couple hours. 
And Thomas is wondering, what are the consequences of not having a proper cylinder break in? High CHTs, high oil consumption, or other things? Um, well, uh, the primary consequence of, of not having a proper break in is that the oil consumption never stabilizes and the, and the engine burns a lot of oil. There are some other consequences having to do with um, since there, there's excessive blow by past the rings because the rings aren't sealing very well, you, you wind up getting uh, oil getting dirtier faster than usual, or you wind up getting excessive heat buildup in the in the oil that might exceed the capacity of the of the uh, oil cooling system. But the most obvious consequence is that uh, that oil consumption doesn't stabilize. Bruce is wondering, why isn't the top compression ring worn by the break-in process? Well, it's worn a little bit, but the compression rings are, uh, in, in standard steel, steel cylinders, the compression rings are, are chrome-plated. Chrome is exceedingly hard metal, uh, much harder than the steel of the barrel. So the lion's share of the wear is going to happen in the barrel. Um, other kinds of cylinders, that's the, the situation is different. For example, chrome plated cylinders, because the chrome plating is so hard, you effectively can't break it in. And so with chrome plated cylinders, channel chrome cylinders, the, the compression rings are, are actually cast iron rings rather than chrome plated rings. And those are what wear. And you're, you're actually, when you're breaking in chrome cylinders, you're breaking in the rings to the cylinder rather than breaking in the, the cylinder to the rings. Again, chrome-plated cylinders don't have a hone pattern. They don't have, you know, sharp peaks and valleys. Uh, it's a, a kind of a different situation. They 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 they, uh, they achieve their oil wettability in a different way, and the break-in, although it needs to be done, is 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 a different process. You're actually you're actually honing the rings to match the cylinder rather than the other way around. <laughs> Uh, Kevin is wondering, are there any differences to consider for carbureted versus fuel injection engines? Mm, nothing that comes to mind, no. I think the rules are pretty much the same. We've had a few people ask this question. Uh, Dennis's is, is, what, um, is there any differences and what's different about a Rotax 912 engine? Well, there's lots of differences <laughs> with Rotax engines. Uh, but um, and and obviously you you can't use CHT as a reference for breaking in a Rotax engine because you typically don't have CHT. You, you've got you've got coolant temperature. Um, but um, I mean the fundamental requirement for break in for a Rotax engine is is the same. Uh, the, the cylinders are honed, uh, and, and you need to run the engine to, to, to break it in, but, um, but some of the rules would be different, um, uh, just because the engine is so different than glycomies or continentals. Hmm. Wally's wondering, what does a glazed cylinder look like with a bore scope? Um, you, you basically don't see the hone pattern. It, it just looks kind of, kind of brownish. You're just seeing carbonized oil. Trent's wondering, uh, if glazing is present, then can it be removed? Well, the, I mean, the way it's removed is to pull the cylinder off the engine and, and re-hone the cylinder. Um, so yeah, it can be removed, but it's kind of painful. <laughs> and you basically start all over again. And sometimes that happens, but we like to try to minimize the probability that's going to happen. Hmm. I guess I really, really um, have, have become very fond of uh, the nickel carbide cylinders because they they break in just about instantaneously and painlessly. Um, the the nickel carbide cylinders have a, a, a tiny um, uh, 
silicon carbide particles, those synthetic diamonds, if you will, uh, embedded in the in the uh, in the nickel plating, uh, and those silicon carbide, um, and and they use they use soft rings, and the the silicon carbide particles are, are just do a amazing job of honing those those rings. Um, the the carbide particles are what provide the wettability because uh, shiny nickel is is not well wettable, but shiny nickel with a network of silicon carbide particles embedded into the into the plating is well wettable, and so the the things pretty much come with oil wettability built in as a feature, and they the the silicon carbide particles break in the the soft compression rings much like uh, uh, chrome does on on their cast iron rings, but does it very very rapidly. So. As far as breaking is concerned, the the nickel cylinders are very very painless to break in and almost surefire. It's very hard to screw it up. It's possible, but it's not easy to screw it up. Rob's wondering uh, how does what has been described with cylinder break in dovetail with considerations with uh, cam follower break in um, and differences uh, in these considerations with uh, roller versus flat followers um, well I don't know that I that I have a lot to say about that we we don't go through any kind of special break-in procedure as far as cams and lifters um, the 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 new generation of lycoming roller tappets seem to be, uh, at least at this point, seem to be a pretty big improvement o over the the conventional mushroom tappets that uh, that Lycomings have traditionally used. Lycomings have always had a lot more problems with cam and lifter spalling than continentals, and the roller tappets um, help quite a lot. Um, and so it's a really worthwhile improvement to the Lycoming engines. Continentals have always had more problems with cylinders. Lycomings have always had more problems with cams and lifters. But yeah, the roll the roller tappets are a are a really good improvement, I think, to the lycomings. Hmm. John is wondering uh, any special treatment uh, break in for turbocharged engines. Uh, no, um, pretty much every pretty much the same rules that I offered. The only the only difference with turbocharged engines, and it's not that much of a difference, but uh, in a normally aspirated engine, in order to run the engine close to 100% power, which is what I'm recommending trying to do, you, you have to do it at relative low altitude. Uh, in a turbocharged airplane, you don't have that restriction because a turbocharged airplane thinks it's at sea level regardless of what altitude it's really at. So uh, you can do the break-in in a turbocharged airplane up at higher altitude than you can in the normally aspirated engine. Um, we probably, we don't want to do it real high in a turbocharged engine because when we get up real high, um, the reduced air dens density at high altitudes um, provides less effective cooling. And we're looking for the most cooling we can possibly get while we're breaking in the cylinders because cylinders are running hot. Um, so I'm not recommending that you'd break in a turbocharged engine at 20,000 feet but you don't have to break it in at 2,000 feet. You can climb to a more comfortable altitude if you want to and still be able to maintain close to 100% power. So this seems to go with Mark's question here. Uh, uh, Mark says, I live in southwest Colorado. My field elevation is 7,600 feet MSL. Uh, he's swapping engines and buying a new one, a normally aspirated Lycoming IO390. Um, the old one has been uh, removed already. I'm concerned that I won't be able to produce sufficient horsepower to seat the rings. Um, I'm thinking of asking the manufacturer to run my engine on a test stand long enough for CHTs to stabilize. Um, wondering, do you agree with this approach? Uh, is there any other options for him? Well, it, it is definitely a problem. It's really hard to break in a normally aspirated engine when you're 
when your field elevation is up that high. Um, it would not hurt to, if, if you can get a longer run-in period on the engine before they ship it to you, uh, it would certainly not hurt if you had the ability to, um, to, to fly the airplane to lower altitude for at least part of the break-in flight. Um, and of course, you, you're going to want to run the engine at, at wide open everything at that altitude to get as much power as you can. But um, um, both having uh, some additional running time on the engine before it's shipped to you and uh, flying to lower elevation, if you can do that for the, some, the, in the first couple of hours would be, both of those would be helpful. Mm-hmm. Uh, Megan's wondering, um, how soon can I start adding cam guard after overhaul and break in with new cylinders? I would recommend hold, holding off uh, until about 25 hours. Uh, let's see here. Okay, Felix is wondering, what about the Phillips uh, 66 Type M 20W50 straight uh, mineral oil for use uh, during break-in? Um, that's fine. Again, the the Type M is uh, is the same as the Phillips XC, except that it's a non-AD oil. Um, I haven't seen any compelling uh, evidence that non-AD oil is better for break-in and I've had very good success doing break-in using AD oil. So my personal preference would be to use AD oil just because it keeps the engine cleaner. But you know, if you're going to get rid of it within 10 hours, uh, it's not a capital crime to use non-AD oil. And uh, you know, some people are more comfortable with that. I think it's more tradition than it is science for, for using non, non-AD oil. But um but uh, type M is a perfectly acceptable break-in oil. It's actually was designed designed specifically for break-in. It was. Hmm. Neil uh, asks, uh, talking about additives, I've heard that there have been some problems reported with the use of cam guard in Continental engines using certain types of aero shell oil. Have you heard this? And any comment? Um, I have not heard anything of the sort, and. I've got uh, somewhere on the order of 800 aircraft um, being whose man whose maintenance is being managed by my company, and the the majority of those aircraft are Continental powered and do use Cam Guard, and we have never run into any problem. And I've used Cam Guard in my own Continental powered airplane for well over 10 years now. Richard's wondering, does Lycoming have an option to break the engine in when you buy a new one from them? No. They do, they do, they do a, um, a, a test cell run in on the engine. Um, it's not a terribly long run in. Uh, as far as I know, they don't offer uh, I'm, I'm not aware that you can request from Lycoming that they give your engine an extra long run in. I think all the engines go through the same process. Hmm. Um, Ron is wondering on slide number 37, you had some additional info at the bottom. Wondering what was that? I have no idea, but let's see if I can find right. slide 37. Um, 37, 37, that's slide 37, that's 37. All, it's, all it's at the bottom is the copyright that's it. <laughs> yeah. and stuff, on the same as on most of the other slides. I don't see anything special on 37. Okay. Um, yeah, if, you, if there was something else there, you'll have to let us know, Ron. Um, <laughs> Paul is asking, 
why does the honing go so deep that it creates sharp peaks between valleys? If they went half as deep on the valleys, then there wouldn't be so sharp peaks to remove. Um, well, I, I can't really answer that except for I, I do know that there's been an awful lot of research on optimum hone patterns and so on and uh, uh, about the 30 thousandths, I mean 30 thousandths, the so 30 uh, micro inch, 30 millionths depth seems to be about the, what the sweet spot is, but I, I'm not sufficiently in the weeds on that to be able to comment further. <laughs> Sorry. Something you're not sufficiently in the weeds on. That's yeah, surprising. That's, that's pretty far <laughs> down in the weeds when you get to 30 micro inches. I don't know what happens when you go to 35 or 25. Oh my God. <laughs> that is so minuscule. Yeah. You can't hardly <laughs> feel it with your finger, you know. Okay. So Williams wondered about how many degrees should cylinder temps come down during the break in? Continental factory rebuild engine? Well, it's a little it's a little hard to to generalize on that, but normally you'd expect to see CHTs come down twenty to forty degrees, probably. And and that's that's assuming uh, steel cylinders, uh, nickel cylinders. Uh, you 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 wouldn't see anything close to that large. And uh, Thomas is wondering, anything special he should know about his uh, Millennium cylinders being broken in? No, they're good cylinders. They're conventional steel cylinders. Um, pretty much everything that I've said applies to the Millenniums. The Superior does have its own service bulletin about break-in. Um, and they agree with much of what I've said and they disagree with some of what I've said as far as um, I believe in running the engine a little harder than they than they spec out in their in their uh, bulletin but on the other hand their bulletin assumes that the engine doesn't have an engine monitor and so you're kind of operating in the blind and so they tend to be a little bit more conservative in terms of of, uh, of the amount of power to carry during break-in but if you want to see what Superior has to say, you can you can Google it, and it's pretty easy to find the service bullet, the Superior service bullet, and break in. Okay, let me see here. I'm trying to get to some more good questions here. What is a reasonable value for stabilized oil consumption, Glenn asks? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't want to ask any, any easy questions there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, it, it depends on a whole lot of things. It depends on what kind of cylinders. It depends on how large a bore, whether it's a four or six cylinder engine, um, bigger engines with larger bores and more cylinders always are going to use more oil than smaller engines with a small number of cylinders. Um, uh, nickel cylinders are going to use less oil than steel and steel are going to use less oil than, than, uh, than chrome plated. Uh, so there's just lots of variables there for conventional steel cylinders on a, a six cylinder engine, uh, uh, probably anything between, uh, oh, I don't know, an hour and six and an hour and 20. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I, I didn't say that right, but a, a, a quart per six hours to a quart per 20 hours, somewhere in that range is usually what we expect um, Continental says that anything over a quart in three hours is is cause for concern, and anything over about a quart per hour is unairworthy. Um, but um, in terms of what you expect from newly broken in cylinders, it's it's uh, it can be anywhere between a I'd say a quart and six and a quart and twenty uh, or would be acceptable values. 
and, and there just are so many variables in terms of what that what that number is going to be. Hmm. Jason's wondering uh, if uh, it's STC'd for MOGAS, is there a preference between 100 low lead or MOGAS during the break-in? Um, I would, well, no, it's not, not, not really. Uh, I, I mean, as a general proposition, I would always prefer running unleaded fuel to leaded fuel if you can. Um, just because leaded fuel is filthy and unleaded fuel is a lot less filthy. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't think there's a specific preference with respect to break-in. It's just kind of my general preference that, that I'd, I'd rather see us running on, on unleaded fuel. And I can't wait until we have an unleaded fuel that my airplane can run on. <laughs> mm. Uh, Thomas is wondering, uh, how can you tell nickel carbide cylinders from chrome cylinders from steel cylinders when it's on the engine? Uh, there's a color code on the on the cylinder base. Um, uh, steel cylinders uh, typically do not have any kind of color code on the base flange. Chrome cylinders, are typically the base flange is painted orange. And... Um, and the nickel cylinders, uh, there's uh, there's typically some sort of a striped uh, code to tell you that it's nickel cylinders. It's also very easy to tell looking in a borescope what kind of cylinders it is because the appearance is quite different between the three kinds. But there is a there is a base flange code for anything other than steel cylinders. Gwen is wondering, do you suggest running with the cowl flaps open during break-in? Absolutely. And any anything else you can do to, to get more cooling air on in. Like I said, you know, shallow climbs, high air speeds. Uh, do it early in the morning when the air is cool. Uh, um, don't, you know, it's a good idea not to try to break in an engine on a real hot day uh, because it's it, the thing is just going to be generating a lot more heat than usual. And so anything you can possibly do to keep the cylinders cool, and that's in, including running full rich, cow flaps wide open, so on. It's, it, that's all, all of that ought to be done. Ray's wondering, can you mix a steel cylinder with a nickel carbide cylinder on the same engine if you're only changing one or two cylinders? Yes, absolutely. There, uh, very frequently we see mixed, mixed cylinders on an engine. There's no, no issue there. Uh, Terry's wondering, are chrome cylinders used for longer life then? Um, chrome cylinders um, were, are used for, for several reasons. Uh, they're, they tend to be very, very popular uh, in areas of very high corrosion risk. Um, they're they're real popular among saltwater seaplane operators. They're real popular down in South Florida uh, because un unlike steel cylinders, they they won't corrode if the airplane is sitting unflown uh, in a corrosive environment. And the, if the cylinders are chrome, they're not going to corrode. If the cylinders are steel, they they'll you'll, they'll develop corrosion pitting. Um, it's not a panacea because, of course, you can have chrome cylinders, but it's not going to protect your cam and lifters. But um, uh, but chrome cylinders are, are are popular, particularly in areas of high corrosion risk. Um, uh, nickel cylinders are a more recent development, and they share some of the advantages of chrome cylinders because they also are immune from corrosion. Um, but they they burn less oil and they break in a lot easier than, than than chrome. Chrome is very hard. It lasts a very long time. It wears very very well, um, and it doesn't corrode. Those are the primary advantages of it. But it does use more oil. Wendell's wondering now what would be the ideal altitude for breaking in an engine. Well, if it's a normally aspirated engine, it should be as as low as you feel safe. Um, so you know, a couple thousand feet and 
preferably start off making orbits in the general vicinity of the airport in case something goes wrong and you need to put it back down on the ground. Um, uh, with a turbocharged engine, you can go up higher. Uh, Gwen is wondering, um, Gwen and Bob wish to know about a constant speed prop and contamination of the prop oil pump during break-in. Um, it's pretty much a non-issue. The, the, uh, the, this is a 30 micro inch finish that we're working on. So the, the metal particles that are going to come off during break-in are, are very, very, very tiny. Um, and they aren't going to bother anything. They just, they'll just circulate harmlessly through the engine. Probably most of them will, will go right on through the oil filter because they're so tiny. And then they'll get drained out when we drain in, in, out the break-in oil. And I kind of like to drain out the break-in oil, you know, relatively early. Like I said, around 10 hours or something. Hmm. Brian's wondering, is a magnetic drain plug a good idea during break-in to grab metal in the sump? Well, it's not a terrible idea. But as I said, the 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 stuff that we're generating during break-in is is uh, is so small that it's not really going to hurt anything. So I wouldn't obsess about it, but it's uh, magnetic grain plug is always, uh, is, is always not a bad idea. Hmm. Luke's wondering uh, for the break-in, do you put uh, the same level of oil as usual or do you run a lower level? I wouldn't run a lower level. You probably want to run a higher level because you expect the, the cylinders to be using quite a lot of oil at first until the break-in is complete. So you want to have a little bit more cushion. Um, so if anything, I would want to run a um, higher oil level. Uh, Benson's wondering, is there any benefit to running uh, low RPM at high power versus uh, high RPM at high power or vice versa? Um, well, I mean, in theory, low RPM is going to generate higher um, peak combustion chamber pressures, but and that's probably okay if you're breaking in the engine at 75% power or less, but if you're breaking the engine in at 90% power, um, the you, you probably you you probably be outside of the of, of the operating envelope, but if if you reduced RPM very much, so it really it really depends. Um, we want to run the engine as hard as we can, but we don't want to run it outside of the reasonable operating envelope. Uh, Rick says, you typically recommend keeping Continental CHTs below 380. Would you run them hotter than this for the break-in and for how long? Yes. Um, I, my, what I, my normal recommend, recommendation for Continental cylinders is to um, limit them to a maximum of 400 degrees and preferably um, 380. Um, and my recommendation for break-in is to limit them to 420 for Continentals during the break-in period. Okay, long question from John. Uh, just got his plane back from an Iran with a top overhaul. It's um, IO520 L12 in a Cessna 210. Uh, he put an EDM 900 on the plane with the new engine. Um, he has all six uh, of the 82-hour, 20-year-old uh, factory reman cylinders, uh, nickel silicon carbide coated. The shop did a run-in. Uh, he says he flew the plane yesterday for the first time for 2.7 hours, cruised for 60 minutes, um, land, then cruised for 40 minutes, uh, then cruised for another 40, then land. Um, all cylinder temps hovered around 375, exhaust temps around 350. On the last two climbs at full power, uh, CHT um, 
Climbs at full power cylinder number three EGT went to about 1630 and then it lowered to about 1400 in cruise. All others were around 1350. Uh, he says, should I be concerned? I have a uh, uh, able scope. Uh, should I bore scope number three exhaust valve or what? He's using Phillips 2050 oil. Um, it sounds like the cylinders broke in almost immediately, which is kind of what I'd expect with nickel cylinders. Um, if you experienced one cylinder that had an abnormally high cylinder head temp or uh, exhaust gas temperature um, for a while, and then it then it corrected itself, um, the overwhelmingly most likely reason for that is that one of the two spark plugs was not firing. It was uh, it was fouled somehow, and then the foul wound up clearing itself. Uh, I've, I've seen that happen in my airplane uh, quite a number of times. Um, some, some, but uh, if, if, if it ever happens again, um, the, the way you can conclusively diagnose it is to do a, an in-flight mag check and uh, if, if indeed my presumptive diagnosis is correct that one of the spark plugs isn't firing, then when you shut off one of the two mags, the, that cylinder will go cold and the engine will, will start to run rough because it'll be running on five cylinders and you'll know for sure exactly what, what's going on. But my best guess, given the symptoms that he's described is, is that he had a foul spark plug that cleared itself after a while. Hmm. Well, fantastic. Well, we're really bumping up against the end here, Mike. So what's calls are down. Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, make closing comments to, uh, to the folks that are still on. We still got 660 on. Looks like at one point I saw close to 800 logged in. So great turnout tonight. That's, that's so cool. We've been getting, we've been getting just better and better turnout. It's just very rewarding to see that. Um, I don't have anything real special. Uh, I, uh, my usual reminder about uh, signing up for my monthly newsletter, either going to SavvyAviation.com or checking the box on the post-webinar survey that Tim's going to put up. Uh, my two books are available at Amazon. I'm hard at work at, I was, I was going to say I'm hard at work on book number three. But it turns out that I'm hard at work on books number three and four because we got book number three completely outlined and um, it turned out that it was going to come in at a thousand pages <laughs> and oh, a thousand wow. pages is too long to put in a paperback. So it is going to be volume one and volume two. It's going to be titled Mike Bush on aircraft ownership and uh, it's going to be a two book series. Um, I'm hoping to get the first volume um, uh, done in time for air venture. It's going to be tight, but that's my hope. And the second volume done in time for Christmas. So that's my project <laughs> right now. We've got the cover design, we've got the outline, and we're working on the, the, the first several chapters right now. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm up to. Um, but the first two books are available on Amazon, and I'm hoping the Book three, hopefully, will be up there by this summer. And uh, finally, uh, just to look at, at, at my next uh, first Wednesday of the month webinars. Uh, March webinar is called An IA's Dilemma. Uh, it's, it's kind of based on an interesting uh, case of uh, an IA that, that got into a situation where the aircraft owner was telling him one thing and the IA who did the previous annual on his airplane was telling him a different thing and he was trying to figure out what to do. And it's just kind of interesting and it brings up a bunch of, 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 of issues about uh, the kinds of problems IAs face and, and the way owners and IAs can, can deal with that sort of thing. Uh, April uh, webinar called Errors of Distraction uh, is talking about uh, some of the problems that we see uh, with airplanes that, that come out of uh, maintenance, especially out of annuals with things that haven't been properly tightened, secured, and so on, and um, how frequently that happens, a lot more than anybody wants to admit. 
and uh, how we as aircraft owners have to be um, uh, on guard f about this stuff and, and, and pretty skeptical about an airplane when it first comes out of out of an annual inspection or, or, or heavy maintenance until it's it's proven itself. And the May webinar uh, called Power Plant Resurrection. This is a subject that has come up uh, many, many times. Um, I get a lot of questions about that. this, about what you do when an engine has sat unflown for a long time, whether it's an airplane that went inactive and has been sitting in a hangar for many, many months or many years, whether it's a, 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 an EAB where the, where the builder ordered an engine and, and kind of underestimated when he'd be ready for it. And so it's wound up sitting in a crate for a long period of time before it's ready to mount on the airplane. This, this sort of thing comes up all the time of what happens when you have an engine that's been sitting for a long time and, and what can we do to minimize the chance that it will be damaged when we finally start the engine. So that's what the May uh, webinar is going to be about. And Tim, that's all I have. I'm really, really gratified for the, for the great turnout tonight. And I thank everybody for coming. That sounds wonderful, Mike. Uh, you got a nice uh, lineup of webinars there. Really looking forward to the next uh, several months. And uh, thank you so much. A great webinar tonight. And I want to wish you the best of luck uh, for your test flight on your uh, <laughs> Cessna 310 coming up here. I'm, I'm hoping luck is not necessary, but you never know about these things. So It never hurts to have a little got luck my, on your side. Got my toes and fingers crossed. <laughs> right on. I'm sure it'll turn out just fine for you. <laughs> And to everybody who tuned in tonight, thank you all so much for joining us. Have a wonderful evening. Hope you can join us next week. Thanks, everybody. Night.